Good evening, viewers. This is your host, Peter Schrappen of the Northwest Marine Trade Association, where I currently serve as the Vice President and Director of Government Affairs. Good afternoon. Good evening, Mark Bunzel. Mark, you are on mute. You think we'd have this figured out by now? Mark, you're on mute. Can you hear me okay? There he All is. Right. All Thank right. You, Take I two. <laughs> Yeah, yes. uh, but uh, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. It's a beautiful Thursday evening. I'm sure there's a lot of things you could be doing tonight. and We're going to make it fun and interesting. And uh, we've got uh, uh, Leonard and Lorena Landon, our managing editors of the Wagner Guide, that are going to be assisting us with the updates and joining in the conversation. And later on, we have Mike Beamer and Art Hebert from Skagit Valley College Marine Tech Program and also our Cruisers College program, and they'll be joining us to talk about how to save your boat from sinking. And uh, some of you who saw the title for the show may have seen this, this cryptic pump in a bucket product we talk about, and we'll fill you in on that. We're going to have, have some fun looking at that and deliver uh, some great safety ideas. So with that, Peter, what's going on in the industry How well i yeah i had a good day today mark i did some boating related stuff uh yeah it was good i got a tour of the harbor patrol the seattle harbor patrol the seattle city council voted to not fully fund them which is too bad so they are uh, stuck at 28 uh, men and women patrolling our waters and i got to see what they do in a day in and day out and that was in the morning then i met my kids and wife at and uh, in-laws at Ivor Salmon House. So they boated from Elliott Bay Marina on their Stavy craft and headed over to Ivor's. And we had fish and chips out on the deck, which was fabulous, a real nice. iconic Seattle experience. So that was that was fun. Um, they all had the day off and uh, a good old dear old dad had to work. That's fine. Um, and then I just some headlines that caught my attention nationally. I'm um, looking at some COVID stuff and how there's a Washington Post article today that six feet may not be enough for social distancing, Mark. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, we might be moving forward. That means I need to get a bigger boat, right? Yes, that's right. Love it. Exactly. And then uh, another article that caught my attention was the, uh, the, the headline was fall used to be considered the off season for travel, but not this year. And that really plays well into the whole Seattle Boat Show Live show that we plan on doing week in and week out throughout the course of the rest of 2020 at the very least. And what a fantastic time to go boating in the autumn and the Puget Sound area that fall, you know, the, the leaves change in and uh, yeah, it's a great time to go sailing. Um, and then I'm thinking a little bit more about boating, boat registrations up nationally, 44%. So that's certainly got our attention. We've been dreaming about the day when boaters would uh, <laughs> resort to boating instead of going to Europe or going cruises. Uh, and it looks like we found that cultural realignment. I would never would have, um, you know, obviously it comes at the expense of uh, an awful pandemic. So I, I'm not like cheering this on or anything, but um, it is interesting that people are clamoring to get boats and kayaks and good luck finding a kayak market on the Amazon. That's going to take you several weeks as you might. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. Well, even buying boats, there are boats available out there, uh, yeah. but uh, it's uh, uh, get to your local boat broker. <laughs> They're moving quickly. That's right. Yep. Uh, boat sales are up. That good segue, Mark. Thank you for that one. Uh, boat sales have climbed 6% nationally. Uh, we've seen 230 new boats uh, in the in Washington state uh, in the month of July. So that's, that is very optimistic. And then uh, on the flip side of that coin, a couple boat shows, um, some world famous boat shows, the Mets trade show was canceled. I was able to attend that the last two years in Amsterdam. That was canceled today. That's a big that's the world's largest B2B show. So that uh, is taking the year off there, moving to a virtual experience. And then as you sh shared with me when we first saw each other today about the Annapolis Boat Show, uh, getting mothballed for at least a year. So yeah. um, that's where we find ourselves. Uh, you might notice I've got a new studio. I'm in my home office here, uh, which is the living room. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, uh, we're moving uh, our offices at the Northwest Marine Trade Association just down the hall. We're able to keep our suite, our same suite number, uh, same mailing address. And uh moving into a little bit of a, a, a right sizing, as they say, Mark, that's the, the buzzword. So yeah, we were moving tomorrow. We've been there and there since 1978. So you can imagine the files and the, and the smells of the files that have been permeating the office for the last 10 days. So yeah, that's, that's what I know, well, Mark. I, I think it's a sign of the times. The NMTA is right sizing the office. I was talking to my son today who works in high tech and they're right sizing their offices and more and more people 
just like our school kids are going to be working from home. And this is a major cultural change. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, if traffic is down, it's easier to get around. Uh, it, it, this is this will be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Yeah, um, and you were saying that you've been out and about and you saw some uh, an influx of boaters in your travels in the last week? Yeah, we're going to, with the updates, talk about uh, uh, the San Juan Islands. But uh, last weekend, I got out to... Uh, uh, Cypress Island and out to Susha, and uh, all the Anchorage areas are, are very full. Uh, hard to find a mooring ball unless you get uh, uh, there nice and early. So uh, nice to be confident and comfortable with your anchoring skills. And uh, out at Susha, uh, it was completely, uh, pretty much completely full. And, uh, it, you know, part of that really thrills me that, that people get out there and can enjoy this great, these great opportunities we have with our state parks and excellent facilities. Uh, but wow, uh, we're full now. What's it going to be like next season? And uh, we'll, we may uh, end up dedicating a show to that at the end of the season, wrapping up and talking to some of our state officials and some of the things that they're looking at. Uh, uh, we're closely following the situation with pump out stations and we'll probably have a, a uh, a show on that, uh, not not probably not our most attended show, but it, it, there's hey now information there. <laughs> it's a necessary evil. How's that? No doubt about it. Hi, Landons. How are you doing? Hi, we're doing well. We've been yeah. out and then back here, taking care of some wagoner work, and we'll head out again for the holiday with some grandchildren. Been working hard on a 2021 Wagoner Guide. Many updates for it and a lot of new stuff coming. Yes. Well, why don't you yes. fill us in on, on some of the new things? I, every week it, it amazes me. And we'll talk a little bit about one thing that got me as I, I thought I knew. And we did have it right in our air table. But uh, I might as well uh, spill as to what I'm talking about. I was talking to uh, somebody who was dealing with U.S. Customs. And U.S. Customs... Uh, for those that did come down from Alaska and the BC, and we'll be talking about that a little later also. But U.S. Customs never changed from winter hours. They kept winter hours right on through, which means they're not open till eight o'clock at night, as we say in the Wagner Guide. They're only open till five. And I'll talk about the implications of that later. Leonard Lorena, Lorena, what else? Yes, uh, we have some updates for several cruising areas starting uh, down south. Uh, South Sound docked and just to let folks know the 200 uh, feet of bulkhead was removed along the shore so the fish and the juvenile Chinook salmon are happy and uh, the playground picnic shelter and parking area has reopened. Uh, the, there is a small section at the marina at the docks for day use and so folks uh, can be prepared if you're headed out in September the docks at Dockton Park are going to be totally uh, redone starting mid-September. So keep that in mind. And is there, at, if you mentioned already, but at Docton, there are day use areas open again? Right. Oh, okay, yes, sorry. It, there is a day use area right now. So you can use that. Uh, moving on here, uh, Bill Harbor, they sent in a report. They say they're medium busy. They haven't had the Canadian boaters that they usually have this year, obviously, because of the border closure, but that was interesting. They do get a lot of Canadian boaters uh, during the season, <clears throat> normally. Uh, in Everett, the brand new uh, footbridge is open now to the public. It's quite impressive. It's lit at night. Nice. You can go up the elevator or climb the stairs, uh, go across the railroad tracks up on the hillside. Uh, great views of the um, sound and of the Everett Marina. In fact, Everett Marina is the largest on the West Coast. Uh, that's that's great trivia. Interesting <laughs> note there. Yeah. Are you guys are you seeing a lot of um, mask wearing um, this past week? We have. Uh, yeah. It's still kind of half and half. But half I and half. Yeah. I think more so now at the marinas themselves, people are doing pretty well with that. Yeah, okay. Well, I've got mine here. My mom made it. She's back watching Mark. She has a, I think, enjoys 
Here in Mark Bunzel, she told me this past week. So you've got a fan <laughs> in St. Louis, Mark, <laughs> the, the fan club. Uh, I wanted to add on the uh, on Everett this uh, the bridge Scott, the bridge that Lorena is talking about uh, in the Wagoner Guide where we're uh, in the 2021 Wagoner where we have this described we're actually describing it as a sky bridge because this thing is way the heck up there and uh, it has a beautiful pers uh, perspective from there so it's just it's worth the trip just to go and, and walk this bridge uh, that crosses over the railroad tracks headed up into a nice park area just above the uh, Everett Marina. Moving on, uh, if you're headed down the Swinomish Channel, you should be aware that one of the navigation aids, uh, it was struck and actually fell down into the channel. And so the uh, U.S. Coast Guard maintenance vessel in the Puget from Olympia made its way up here last night and they've been working all day to uh, rectify that issue and put up a new uh, navigation aid. Did you? I just want to point out that wasn't me. I, I didn't <laughs> get that coming through. It, it is. It's uh, day mark number eighteen. It's on the north, uh, just north of the uh, of the twin bridges, or a, a ways north of that. But it's a uh, piling. It's day mark number eighteen, and the steel pile apparently knocked over and fell into the channel area. We've got another interesting story to share. We. I uh, have some friends who are out anchored in Hunter Bay and they called us one evening and said, we have an emergency. Can you help us? We're all out of wine. Do you know huh. where the- <laughs> No, that's an emergency. <laughs> Do you know where the closest grocery store is? And we thought, we said, well, Mud Bay is right next door to Hunter Bay and there is a public beach there. There's no dock, no signage, but you can access the beach by dinghy or kayak and then walk the road over to McKay uh, Harbor, which they did. They found the grocery store. It's really quite a nice grocery store. They had a lovely walk, made their way back with their wine and uh, wanted to thank us for, for the tidbits there on that. So if you're out of wine and you're in Hunter Bay, that's an option. Call, call Leonard and Lorena and they'll tell you where. where <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, call us. <laughs> Save the day when you're out of wine. Guide. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another interesting note, uh, in Fisherman Bay on Lopez Island, we were surprised to learn that there is actually a Lopez port or port of Lopez. And we learned that there is a designated float plane landing zone, which we will put on our maps in, uh, in the Wagoner Guide for 2021, along with many other updates, as Leonard mentioned. But uh, they want to bring awareness to this uh, float plane landing zone. It's pretty difficult for the commercial seaplanes to land when there are so many boats anchored in, in the entire bay. So uh, we want to bring some awareness to that. And the, uh, this float plane landing zone is on the northwest area of Fisherman Bay. So if you kind of visualize Fisherman Bay, then there's a peninsula that sticks up. Uh, on the northwest side, visualize this uh, landing zone on the water that runs along that, uh, the, the, par the runway itself runs from a southwestern point to a northeastern point. The northeastern point is just bare, probably about 200 feet off of the dock of uh, Island Lopez or uh, the Lopez Islander Village uh, Resort. So just, to, just off of that, about 200 feet, and then go from there southwest, parallel along the shoreline. So if you're in that area, try to avoid anchoring in there. The float planes get a little, uh, uh, a little bit tense when they're trying to land in that area. And there's no buoys marking off the runway. So uh, 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 it'll be much clearer in the next Wagner Guide next year, but for now, uh, follow Leonard's directions and, uh, and avoid that corner of Fisherman's Bay. Moving on to British Columbia, we have some reports Sea Star Winery property near Port Browning, which we all love on North Pinder Island, is actually for sale and they don't know what that means for next year, so we'll keep you posted on that. The same owner put up his other property, the gorgeous vineyards on Saturna Island, beautiful piece of property. Uh, that actually has sold and uh, we don't know at this time what that means, if we'll have, still have public access at Breezy Bay or not on Saturna Island. We'll keep you posted on that one. Fairwinds Marina uh, 
off the Strait of Georgia. They've completed their large, beautiful building, Upland. Uh, new showers, new office, laundry is on the first floor, and a new restaurant and pub on the second floor with fantastic views. Uh, Port Browning, another favorite. They may have a different dock configuration next season. They will know probably in October, and again, we'll, we'll keep you up to date on that one. A Blind Channel Resort off Johnstone Strait. They've added some new mosaics and artwork on the docks for something new next year. And uh, something important to note here is that the tidal generator that's been out in the water there in the main channel, just off their resort, has been removed. It was a research project. It's uh, uh, met its uh, purpose and it has been removed. Uh, but it may still appear on some of your nautical charts, but uh, it's not there anymore. Shoal Bay, good news in Broughton. Shoal Bay has been closed for quite a few years for refurbishing, and they tell us that they uh, are planning to have that open for guest moorage next year. They have approximately 175 feet of dock space, non-potable water on the docks, no power, limited Wi-Fi, please call ahead for space. And they ask that you be self-contained since they don't have showers or uh, restrooms at this time. And keep well, in my mind- my question on that, Lorena, uh, is will they have their little doggy patch back? Uh, yeah, don't know, we'll, we'll find we'll out. On that. We'll have to go visit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also keep in mind that Minstrel Cove near Lagoon uh, Cove Marina, there are new docks there. They're detached from shore, but they're nice docks. And uh, if you don't know, Minstrel Cove was the center of activity uh, much earlier in earlier history. I mean, dances and uh, a store and uh, shipbuilding and repairs and so forth. Uh, but the dock or the pier deteriorated over the years and people moved elsewhere. So the pier has been removed. But there are brand new docks now available. Will they be uh, charging for moorage then? Um, my no. understanding it's free uh, at this point. We'll find out next year when we hopefully visit and check it out. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, Echo Bay, of course, the native uh, First Nation purchased Echo Bay and they use the acronym KHFN. So there's a new phone number there, and that'll be in the Wagoner with more information. So lots of updates for 2021. And I've got uh, one more of this. So back down in our area here in Port Townsend, uh, they just opened up a new waterway. Uh, this has, the, uh, it's between Indian Island and Marlstone Island. So kind of uh, just uh, to the east of uh, Port Townsend Harbor and uh, Indian Island and, and Marlstone Island and the southern end of Killisset Bay, uh, which is formed between those two islands. And that, uh, that area was bridged about 60 years ago to put a road through there to connect those two islands. And uh, they just finished a project to put in a bridge now, and they broke that land bridge, that, they, that was the dike that was put in there and breached that. And for the first time in 60 years, there's water flowing in and out of Killisset Bay on the south end of it. And uh, so the, uh, there's about a 10 foot draft, air draft apparently for the bridge. And uh, they expect that they will have about 10 feet of water draft in that channel after it clears out. But of course, it's gonna take some time for the, all the silting to clear out. And the other note is uh, it may and probably will have some effect on the tidal level changes in uh, Mystery Bay and Killistet Bay in, uh, in terms of the timing for that, and maybe even the extent of the tidal change, and nobody really knows what's gonna happen with that. Uh, but that's a major change that just happened. Um, one other note, I wanted to remind everybody that there's a, uh, US Coast Guard has a survey out right now, and that's for their, water, their shallow water waterways. And if you go look at the local notice to mariners, uh, you can see the link for that. And a little later in the presentation here, I'll. Uh, if I have time, I'll put something up on the chat with the uh, with a link for that as well. So take the survey if you uh, uh, travel any of the shallow waters. Coast Guard defines shallow waters as anything less than 12 feet. So that's our updates, I think. 
Well, we've got two questions that have come in. And just a reminder to those of you watching, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you have the ability to, uh, under Q&A, to pose questions to us. And uh, uh, we've got uh, the first question that came in, which is relevant to the updates, is uh, uh, John Grace is asking, where's a good place to try and social distance for the three-day weekend? They'll be leaving for Manacortes, and they're hoping to go to Susha. Leonard, Lorena, you want to take that one? Uh, whoa. Well, well, Susha will be busy. <laughs> we can guarantee Susha that. Susha will be busy. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's on. Well, possibly on the way to Susha would be Cypress Island. Uh, and probably you, you'll, uh, you'll be hard pressed to find a buoy there. They'll probably be full. There are about 12 of them in Eagle, uh, Eagle Harbor on the east side of Cypress Island. But it's, it, those have been full all the time, we, times we've been there. There are, there's a, there are some anchoring areas or there is anchoring space uh, just to the south of the field of buoys. Uh, try and go down a ways to deeper water. There's some eelgrass in the shallower areas, but go a little bit deeper and you'll have a good time there. And you can get some social distancing. There's, there's I think it's 25 miles worth of trails on Cypress Island. Uh, and if, so if you head in there, you'll find some social distancing. Also deep, um, deep cove, deep bay at the south end of Cypress Island. That's another good place to go, very close to Anacortes and kind of on your way up to uh, Susha. The other, other than that, I'd say go for places that are, um, that are not the most popularized place. So uh, yeah, for instance, in Lopez Sound, uh, with settled weather, uh, right in the middle, or not middle, middle way, middle between north and south on the uh, west side of uh, Lopez Bay, or less Lopez Sound, a uh, great little bite in there for Anchorage. You, we were in there, only had two other boats with us. The other one is Mud Bay down at the south, just south of Hunter Bay. And Hunter Bay is usually quite full, but Mud Bay usually has a, only a, a few boats in it. Another one that is nice is East Sound. And again, that's not on your way to Susha, but uh, another great destination. The anch it's all anchoring, uh, but there's a county dock you can uh, take your dinghy into to access the town of East Sound or the village of East Sound. Great little destination uh, on your, that's, a, that's my list right now <laughs> for, that I can think of. Uh, and I, see, I see a question up here, Daymark 18, and someone says it's on the south end, but I see that it's right here. It's on the north. On the north, right yeah. here. So. Okay, uh, and, and we have a bonus question here though. Yeah, they're coming in, relevant. this is great. What model boat do the Landons have? What do you use for boats? <laughs> so we, we have uh, put a lot of miles onto our uh, 2004 46-foot uh, 46 DeFever pilot house. So it's a DeFever pilot house, 46 feet, and uh, lots and lots of miles on it. And it has taken us safely to a, no a number of places. We love it. It's, uh, it's a Heavy boat, 66,000 pounds for that size, and a very seaworthy, seaworthy vessel. A good, the definition of a coastal cruiser, let's put it that way, perfect for that. Where do you keep your boat? I would keep it at Cap Sandy. So that's its very home nice. right now. Nice. And Diane Lander had a good comment uh, on the chat line where she said, uh, uh, instead of the San Juans, consider going south into the South Sound. Uh, and she just was down there for 21 days, called it fabulous cruising, not very crowded. Uh, Leonard, Lorena, and I separately, we were down there earlier in the season, and it was uh, very pleasant. So for the holidays, I would consider going, going south if you want to socially distance and have plenty of room to anchor and places to go. Okay. Um, we had, you know, over the past couple of weeks, we've been telling uh, about some of the issues of the sensitivity in Canada when an American boat comes in or comes through. And uh, we've told you the story of, of uh, private citizens uh, watching and observing American boats and calling the RCMP to go check it out because the policy in Canada is that uh, they really don't want American boats coming through the border, but some have been coming through legitimately. They may, uh, as Leonard pointed out last week, they may have Canadian owners of the boat. They, they may be uh, having a captain take their boat up there for service. So, uh, but 
uh, at the beginning of the season, a lot of the, the trawler form and a few other things were talking about Northwest Explorations, the charter company out of Bellingham, having a, a flotilla of boats going up to Alaska. And they were actually professional crews taking the boats up so that they could run their flotilla programs in Southeast Alaska. The season has ended and our good friend, Brian Pemberton, who used to own Northwest Explorations, led the group of bringing the boats down from Ketchikan. And he had some really interesting observations that I'll share with you. Thank you, Brian. Now, uh, when they left Alaska, the next stop was Prince Rupert, where they went to clear Canadian customs. And uh, when they started to approach Prince Rupert, they were met by the Harbor Patrol with lights on and sirens. And uh, it wasn't a hello, how are you? Uh, welcome to Canada. It, they wanted to make sure that they went directly to the lightering dock where people normally go to clear customs. And they did. And uh, the, uh, uh, they, they tied up to the lightering dock. The uh, Coast Guard uh, 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 or CBSA officials came over to talk to them. And they had a pre-printed statement that they gave them and asked them to sign. And uh, I'll try to put this in as nice a terms as possible, but the agents actually said, these are very careful times. And at this time, American boats are not welcome in Canada. Why are you here? What are you doing? Uh, is this a commercial trip? And they explained that it was, and they signed off. And then the CBSA officials gave them the ground rules for their trip, and they were doing what we have been referring to as the Alaska loophole. And this is a treaty, that, a treaty that's been in place for, uh, I think, over 100 years that calls for uh, U.S. boats having the ability to go up through the inside passage to get to the U.S. areas in Alaska. So what it said is you can take this trip, but we, we want you to be completely self-sufficient. We don't want you to go ashore. Uh, uh, we don't want you to go into marinas or towns and restaurants. If you need provisions, call this number and the provisions will be delivered to the dock. Uh, obviously you'll pay for them and uh, they'll be left on the dock and you can lift them over and place them into your boat. And if you need fuel, uh, only the captain can get off the boat. The crew cannot get off the boat. But my point is there's a procedure now for how to get through Canada. And this is a, assuming they allow you in. And so they'll do a judge, whether you're doing something for judgment, whether you're doing something for recreation or you're truly passing through. So uh, we're kind of looking at this and observing this uh, uh, as to what the situation could be for next year. We don't know whether COVID-19 will be completely clear to the satisfaction of, of uh, our friends to the North of Canada. Uh, but there are, it uh, looks like there's gonna be some ways to do this to get through up to Alaska. And uh, at the Wagner Guide, we're gonna be reporting on this. We're, we're looking to use these procedures for our flotillas uh, and uh, uh, for our flotillas going up to Southeast Alaska. So we'll continue to report on that. Additionally, uh, uh, they uh, had a float plan. Uh, they did make better progress than their float plan. They had an eight day float plan to come through British Columbia. They did, were able to do it in six. And one of the things the Canadians would like is that when you get to the point where you're leaving British Columbia, they have a number for you to call to report in that you're now leaving. And uh, so, I, I look at it as good news that there is a procedure in place. And uh, uh, Brian told us as they followed the procedure, they went exactly the way they were. They were intercepted three times by the RCMP, but the RCMP boats pulled up. There was no communication, none on the radio. They counted the boats, they looked them over, and then they went on their way. So uh, uh, things, are, things are shifting a little bit. Uh, it's not going to be, uh, I don't know if it'll ever be like it's been in the past, but if we are in a COVID-19 environment next summer, there might, may be a way that, uh, that if you're going up. So, so thawing, it sounds like Mark. 
A thawing of the. It sounds like a thawing is going on. I don't know if I'd go that far. Okay. I think it's a hundred-year-old treaty and figuring out how can we work within uh, what the two countries agreed to. Leonard, you were going to. Yeah, yeah, Mark. I was just going to add uh, just all the same the things that you mentioned. We have. Uh, a couple of people have been uh, staying in email contact with us at Wagoner, and uh, one of them was a, a boater that went up to Alaska doing the pass through about a couple of months ago and then returned recently. And uh, then another boater that's uh, currently underway. And uh, all of both, of both of them report exactly what you're talking about. Uh, the, the boater that went up a couple of months ago and then came back more recently said that the procedures had changed over the last two months and they're a little bit more. Uh, better defined, but in exactly exactly what you described. There's a rigid procedure. There's a uh, CBSA at the entry uh, at the entry points has a script almost that they're going down. The boaters that we talked to had to do the same pledge that they would go straight through, not stop. They could stop for fuel, and uh, the one that's on the way up did stop at fu for fuel. But other than that, they 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 don't need provisions. They're not making any other stops, and. Uh, and exactly that they're following all of the prescribed regulations and rules so uh, that's part of it the other one that was interesting to note uh, and i think the this actually this came from you mark a number that uh, up on the north end of vancouver island we had a report from a reliable source that over this the entire summer uh, they had 12 one two 12 a dozen boat u.s boats come through and that was it uh, and that's very different than some of the uh, unreliable numbers that we that have been tossed around that uh, claim some hundreds of boats or some number something like that so there's a small number this is all also consistent with the uh, information that we got from the uh, u.s customs and border patrol people when i called them in ketchikan about a month or so ago and they said there is a trickle of boats coming through uh, and so it's kind of all consistent that a uh, small number of boats, there's established procedure uh, for the large, for the most part, people are following the procedures and honoring the, uh, all of the prescribed rules that are, that are in place by BC. So. Well, great. Well, Mark, I think we should get into uh, how we can not, uh, how we can save our boat, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got two guests, Mike Beamer, who just popped up. There he is. And uh, Art Hebert, who will be uh, joining. Both uh, Mike and Art are part of our Cruisers College program. Mike is the chair uh, of the Marine Technology Department at Skagit Valley College and uh, pretty much runs the programs at the uh, beautiful Marine Technology Center in Anacortes, which is training. Well, Mike, you tell us about what you do yeah. for a living. We're, we're trying to train some, some new people to fix boats because all of us that want to be on the water desperately are going to need some new technicians. So that, that is our number one charge. So Art and I and Matt, and we got a whole crew. We are training the next generation of mechanics and electricians and, and, and people to, to work on boats. And so that's what we do up at our center. And um, we also, as you know, we partner with Wagner, we do Cruisers College. So we, uh, a lot of the participants here have probably been to classes where we do weekends for boat owners and we're hopeful to uh, return to some of that this fall and, and keep things going. So um, I wanted to, uh, as listening in, I always wanna say that as an educator, I have to say we're blessed. Art and I have been out on our boats and, and cruising around, but I'm always irritated when I have to go back to that four letter work word in September and October because it is so beautiful to go out and cruise and a lot of people aren't there so I would really encourage everyone to get out in the fall it is so beautiful and last summer first time in 20 years my wife and I went south and did the south sound and just like many people chimed in and we had an absolute wonderful time um, way better than expected so um, I would encourage that the weather is still going to be nice so yeah. And we're thrilled to have Art with us. Uh, Art has, uh, Art, how many years? 30 years with the U.S. Coast Guard? No, I couldn't, I, I couldn't stay that long. I jumped to 28. 28. <laughs> I was close. I was close. So Art has had some incredible experiences on the water. And uh, Art, thank you for your service with the Coast Guard. You guys do a fabulous job, and I, I'll brag a little bit. I think you were responsible for the Coast Guard boats for this region. Did I overstate that? 
I had a period of time uh, in the early 2000s where I was the chief engineer for the boats of the Puget Sound. Yeah. So uh, we're glad to have him and glad to have him teaching and part of the program. So uh, part of our courses we teach, uh, we have a lot of practical different ideas. And there was an idea that hit me as brilliant a couple of years ago. And that was Mike Beamer's Pump in a Bucket. Kind of a catchy little name and, and I'm, we're gonna focus on this, but it, it was real interesting. Mike was telling me last week about uh, an actual situation of a boat that started flooding. And Mike, I'll let you tell the story and then we'll talk about what is a pump in a bucket. Yeah, so, well, I have to be honest, I don't have all that many original ideas. So um, Captain Ada Lot down there in Deception Pass, Cornet Bay years ago, had told me about the bilge pump in a bucket from all the boats that they rescued in Deception Pass. And so I've always had one on board. Uh, this couple, two weeks ago, I was out crabbing on my small boat. <clears throat> we heard a call on the radio that someone was taking on water and sinking. And, you know, you're like, oh, well, that's, a, that's right where I'm at. I <laughs> and as mariners, that's what we do, right? We're going to render some assistance. And so. Well, it's uh, the and, law. Yeah. Well, I was, and um, Art, he'll, he'll, he can chime in a little bit. He's done this a lot with all his years in the Coast Guard. And I have, I've helped out people in distress before, but not really in a sinking situation. And so um, we ran over there in our little 18 foot uh, crab boat. I was, you know, checking crab as we were underway. It took us about eight minutes to get over there. And I got rid of my watch and my wallet and cell phone. And, and uh, I was already wearing a life jacket and went on board. So Mike, did they call a mayday on the radio or? Um, I believe it was a mayday. I was in the back of the boat. I wasn't on the VHF. So, but they were clearly um, in contact with the Coast Guard in distress. Um, the report was, you know, the engine room is flooded. No pumps. We're going down. And so we thought that sounded serious, serious enough that, you know, we would get over there. And so um, <clears throat> I rendered assistance. We got on board and uh, one of the things we want to share is that, so our art will chime in with a little bit of what you should do ahead of time, but it was after the fact, I was just there. And so when you call Mayday, and with our new radios, of course, if, you know, if you can push your distress button, that's way better. But your checklist, we've always said you should, who am I, how many people on board? Um, when I got on board, it was not the boat owners, so they didn't really have tools or a lot of knowledge of the boats, but I started going through my mental checklist because I've done and been involved with Art's Creative Solutions to a Bad Day at Sea, right? This is a great class, catchy name. It happens it's to us, right? Seattle Boat yeah. Show. Yeah. So when I got on board, I said, have you closed the seacocks? No. And so I'm like, well, there's two of you. That's good. I'll do engine room. It was a 40-foot, 39 tri-cabin. I forget the make. Um, could be any of our boats. And so I, I knew it had two heads. I'm like, someone go forward, get those seacocks secured, somebody go aft, I'll do the engine room because that was the, the first thing that we did. I knew that it was not, I asked them, they had not struck bottom or a log or anything. So it wasn't a, a strike. And so in my mind, I'm thinking through the scenarios of what's going on and, and how are we gonna help? And so I have to admit it's a little unnerving when you look and the engine room is four feet deep in water or whatever, like, ah! And so um, the engines were getting shut down. And when I went into the engine room, I noticed right away to shut off seacocks because in my mind it was you shut off seacocks first and then we're gonna look for the other hull penetrations, which is really your shaft seals and your rudder posts. Like if, if, if you didn't hit something, that's where the water's gonna be coming from. And I'm thinking to myself, all I have is this little 18 foot crab boat. I don't have any supplies. I didn't have my bilge pump in a bucket which I carry on the big boat and that Art carries. Um, so what am I gonna use to potentially stop water ingress? And we got on board and the good news is when I, I was in shorts, when I jumped in the engine room, the water was nice and warm. It was like bath water. And so I knew right away that was not the, you know, the Salish Sea coming in through something. That water had been preheated coming through an engine. And so I had a little bit of a breath 
you know, we got a little bit of time here. We still closed all the seacocks. We started assessing it. It was really bow down. There was a lot of water in the bow. Um, if it had really been uh, some other water ingress, I don't know that we'd have saved the boat. But uh, we started going, we went through that checklist. In my mind, we got the seacocks closed. It was warm water. I did stop partway through once we got the water to start receding. So um, what we ended up doing is luckily uh, Boat US came on site and they had portable pumps that they gave me, which is exactly like what Art and I'll show you, this bilge pump in a bucket that we carry on our big boats. And so had we had that, it would have been much better because as soon as you start pumping water and see that you're making a little slow bit of progress, you can kind of breathe. And so that's when I had them um, do a little video and I'm gonna try and share my screen here for a second and show you this video. Um, so this was us. This was me after about in the, uh, build. 20 minutes not, of water just pumping. A little. Just a little bit of water. But it's warm water, so we're not sinking. It's warm. And so you can hear the doors banging. It was really unnerving. She's going to pump out. We'll find out where the leak is. So you had some sea, some ac action from the sea there also. Yes, it was, um, yeah, it was a little bumpy out. And, and so, you know, what goes through your mind? Well, luckily I was calm enough. I get that from my grandmother that I said, hey, let's stop and shoot a video and take some pictures. You know, we're not <laughs> totally thinking. We only have a thousand gallons of water or so in this boat. Um, because I wanted to, to use it for our class and for uh, a, a teaching moment. And so that was kind of, you know, what we did and what transpired. The Coast Guard was a long time getting on scene. The other part of the checklist is after you, you know, close through hulls, you start looking for water ingress is why aren't my bilge pumps working? And, um, you know, there should have been a lot of advance notice at that point. And the other thing was, instead of standing around, there was so much debris. So having a clean engine space and a proper boat could go a long ways because there was all these oily rags and oil bottles and I, the, the amount of stuff, I probably spent eight, 10 minutes just throwing stuff out of the bilges to make a nice clean spot because we knew the pumps were coming but you don't want to put a pump in and immediately suck it a rag over it and have it stop functioning. And so, you know, we're, there was a, like a two by eight, eight feet long. I don't know what that was doing in the engine room, but we got that out of the way and all this other stuff out of the way. And, and uh, you know, once it got down to the oil pans or so, I knew the boat was in reasonable condition and I, I jumped off, the Coast Guard was on scene and we kind of jetted off. So, um, now you told me, and, and I've seen this happen before, because the Coast Guard and Puget Sound is pretty busy, but it took them an hour to get there. And I think the lesson there is, yeah, put out that call because other mariners can come to the aid or we could come to the aid with our pump in a bucket. And I, oh, and you're gonna have to explain what's in that pump in a bucket. I, I will, actually, I might let Art explain. So I'm gonna show you another little, um, let me share my screen. So one of the things we've done as part of, the, our mission is education and we, we share and give away knowledge all the time. I mean, we also do our, our classes and stuff, but we started a promotional program for Schedule A College. And we're called the Scallywags and you can find us on YouTube. And what we have is some tech tips. And we only have about four published, um, pretty good tips so far. And we have about a hundred in the queue. It's gonna take us multiple years to get them all publicized, but one of them is, is the pump in a bucket. So if any of you are interested, let me share my screen. If you go to YouTube and um, this is, if you just put in right here, there's a Skagit Valley College, the Scallywags. This is Tech Tip 10. And I'm not gonna go through the whole video. It, you can watch it. It's great, Art's gonna talk about it, but this is what we needed and that's what uh, Tobo brought us. And it was a high capacity pump and uh, it was ready to go. And that's what we used to evacuate water on this boat because it had no working bilge pumps. And, and that was a, a problem when they left port with this unfamiliar boat to them that they, I, I would not go to sea 
And so it was kind of interesting. The people that were delivering the boat asked me, you know, can I buy you something, whatever? And I said, no, no. And I said, you know, do you have any advice? And I said, yes, let me send you a YouTube link to the bilge pump in a bucket because I would not go out on a boat without one. And so- Can you, can you go back to that picture or is Art gonna explain I, the- Art will talk through it a little bit and then- Good. Uh, about what the bucket is and actually a couple of things. Um, yeah, and Mike, I have a question. Can you tell me again how to find that on YouTube? Yes, uh, Peter, you just type in SVC for Schedule College, okay. Scallywags. Great. I had to figure out how to spell scallywags earlier. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, <laughs> I wasn't going to admit to that, Mark. Thanks. <laughs> I know there's misspelling. It's our boat club and students created it decades ago before me. And if you look up what a scallywag really is, it has something to do with mariners that smell bad, swear a lot, and are usually drunk, and apparently can't spell. Very right. good. But we're sticking with tradition. That's the way maritime is. So um, don't, don't fight the name. That's right. So, Art, right, you want to talk a little bit about the bucket? Because you did an improvement on your bucket versus mine. And you've been in many, many more of these situations than I've been in. And I was so fortunate it was warm water. Oh, by the way, it was just a giant hole in the exhaust that was pumping, you know, hot water in. The pumps weren't working. Boats eventually doesn't stay afloat. So Art can kind of ping in with some ABYC stuff and why yes. we could have avoided this. Right, so I've delivered a few boats um, all the way to Alaska and uh, where I think that this, in my training, one of the things I talk to my students about is, is look, um, the sooner you know that you have a lot of water in your bilge, the earlier and better that you can actually do something about it. So if your boat, like it became an ABYC standard, I'm assuming somewhere in the late 80s, where at the operation station, bilge pumps on, there should be a light indicating that the pump is working. And, you know, I was driving a very nice boat, 52 foot Grand Banks, it was lovely. And for the first four hours, every time I'd be looking around, I'd catch a glimpse of just a little bit of a yellow light, run for 10 seconds and shut itself off in the engine room. So I went down, I looked, the bilge pump is fine. I couldn't see any water coming in. I gnawed on my back of my neck for easily a uh, better part of a day because I kept going down there. I went under the engine all around figuring it was a bad shaft packing leak, a loose hose. It's in the engine room. It's got to be in the engine room. And then finally, I literally dewatered it with a sponge in a bucket. And that's when I found the limber hole where the water was draining from all the way in the front. And it was actually the forward head overboard or the forward sink overboard that uh, the boat had been painted and the bedding of that through hull was allowing water in and it was migrating all the way to the engine room. It didn't do it for the three weeks before the boat went north because it was sitting at the dock and that overboard was above the water line. As soon as I started plowing my way through Canada, in comes the water. And, and I, I knew that I had control over it. I was, it was just gnawing at me because the boat was gonna go into charter and charter customers don't like little yellow lights that keep coming on turns out. So uh, we were able to figure it out, sourced it, 5200 it in, in uh, Fury Cove from the dinghy, and it was great the rest of the trip. But because of that notification, I had ample time to methodically figure it out, even though I was maybe slower than some, but I got it done. So oh, Art, which would be better, high water alarm or, or the indicator light on the, uh, on the bilge pumps? Either either i mean oh. if you're if you're in there and and you know your bilge pump is running with some regularity you know most boats if the engines are running you're not hearing it so if there's a light on that's one thing uh there's devices you know the the weems and plath man overboard fob that they have you can put that in the bilge and if it gets wet it'll give you an alarm that you're sinking there's a lot of different ways to work around this and if you can find the flooding water when it's three inches instead of three feet the odds of you resolving it go up exponentially. And, uh, and that's always kind of been the key is early advanced warning. You know, if you haven't hit something, most of the time I tell people, shut your engines off. If you don't know where the water's coming from, just shut your engines off. I know it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, it's 
especially you, you have to assess your situation. If you're going to go on the rocks, well, you won't be sinking anymore, but yeah, you could have other problems. But having your engine running and working against you is worse sometimes than having it on just for the sake of having it on. Um, I've had mufflers blow out and lazarettes in my Coast Guard experience. I did eight years of search and rescue in Long Island on, in New York. So everything happened at 50 miles an hour and, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fun way to spend your 20s. But it, uh, a lot of sinking, a lot of boats and almost always it was a maintenance thing or some part, you know, a riser failed and it blew out a hose or something that wasn't quite right. And the exhaust system is usually the culprit. So it's a really, if you want to spend your money looking at something, have a good inspection fairly regularly of your exhaust system. Yeah, can, if I could chime in, Art, that was the, the, the hardest thing when I got on board this boat was the water was three quarters of the way up the engines. Yep. And I have no idea where it was originating from, right? And that if I have to dig in past my elbows to get to the through hulls and stuff, I don't know if any of those things were leaking. So early awareness is key. It really helps. and. Uh, you know, then the, the, the bilge pump in a bucket trick, that's, uh, I put that together. One of the rules of thumb, a lot of people say, well, how many bilge pumps should I have? And there's a mathematical formula and there's all this stuff. What I teach is for every 10 feet, you should be able to pump a thousand gallons an hour. Huh. So if you have a 30 foot boat, you should be able to pump 3000 gallons per hour. And that's total. Um, you can have it in however you want to shape it. I, I personally, I have a 30 foot boat. And I have a 300 gallon an hour pump installed and a 4,000 gallon per hour bilge pump in a bucket. And um, I like my odds because of my training and I'll work with that. But to install a bilge pump properly in a boat that doesn't already have one there or you're looking to upgrade, it can be pretty expensive. You can have, you know, through hulls, running extra wire, making sure the wire is the right size, overcurrent protection, switching, all that stuff can be you can drop a thousand dollars real easy to put a pump in and um, my build pump in a bucket is most expensive thing is the pump itself i got regular drain hose from like home depot for like shower drains and stuff like that i got a 20 foot piece for 5.99 i bought an extension cord 20 feet long a number 10 gate big wire and i spliced it in with a pair of alligator clips and i can hook it to a battery I have it in a bucket because it kind of reminds me of the Coast Guard used to have these drop pumps. Actually, they still do have these drop pumps. They throw them out of helicopters, drop them out of planes, throw them in the water and fish them over to people with a heaving line and pass this thing. And it's a big, you know, 35, 40 gallon aluminum can with a Honda engine and instruction card written in six languages. It's a whole thing. But that's a that's kind of like a I think that's 200 gallons a minute or hundred and something gallons a minute. It's a pretty substantial pump. But the fact that it was portable, that you could throw it in the water and pass it to somebody, that you could move it to any platform and, uh, and have it work, the only thing you need with the bilge pump in a bucket is a functioning battery. So uh, that helps a lot. But if you don't have that, but you can also use it to pump out your dinghy when, you're, when it fills up with rainwater in November. You can take your bucket out and you're not gonna be able to do that with an installed bilge pump. So. so this isn't just for my boat, but the way you've worked this out, the beauty is you can hand it to somebody else who's in trouble, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's, and that's the key to it is it's, it's portable, it's easy, any good battery. You know, Mark, I could actually pull alongside of you and um, both of Art and I, I have like a 25 foot lead for my alligator clips for any good battery and a, right. I could actually put it in your boat and clip it onto a working battery in my boat and activate it. As we know with boating stuff with like spare parts, if I've never had to use mine and that's the way I'd like to keep it. You know, if I have it on board, I don't need it for myself. Maybe I could lend it to somebody else um, who's in need. Yeah. Um, but when you really go for it and, and when the tow boat came up to me because um, we don't carry one of these on our little 18 foot crabbing boat. It doesn't have any through hulls or penetrations. If it starts sinking, I'm headed for the beach. But um, on our other boat, I would have had it. And, and that's all it took was 4,000 gallons just mentally to see that in five minutes, the water dropped an inch, you know, just to know that we were keeping up with it and we were going to be able to find a solution. Yeah. And so, now, Landon's, you guys 
took the pump in a bucket and made a modification. What did you do? Well, we, uh, so the bucket was the part, uh, I, I wasn't quite sure. I, my visualize, I visualized that this uh, pump is inside this bucket and then you'd need to get some holes in, otherwise the, this bucket's gonna float. So Lorena came up with a solution which she had this nice little basket that's about a foot square uh, with a woven, uh, kind of a very loose woven screening around the bu this, uh, this basket. And the basket then is about a foot and a half square and about a foot and a half deep, holds the, uh, holds the pump. Uh, and then it also holds the hose itself, which is a, it's a hose that was designed for uh, emptying the, uh, the, these large um, swimming pools, portable swimming pools. So the hose is collapsed and they can wound, it, it rolls up into a nice compact uh, affair, but it also opens up into a very, very large diameter hose so that you don't have any resistance coming out. So that's our plan. We haven't used it yet, uh, but it's all set up and ready to go, thanks to Michael. It's I made a, a modification to mine where I, uh, on the leads, I have clip leads to connect directly to a battery, but I also have a cigarette lighter adapter because my boat's an older boat and it's got cigarette lighter adapters all over the boat. And I've made a note to do one with a USB plug because I now have USB plugs all over the boat to get power. But I, I just visualize that you know, getting down there, getting down to my battery box, opening it up and connecting the battery would be a couple of valuable minutes. And if I could take power, 12 volt power from another place, it saved me a little bit of time. So that's my modification. Yeah, uh, one of the other benefits that we really like is, um, if you think about most modern cruising boats, you have at least three areas, a bow area, an engine room area, and a lazarette. The beauty of a portable pump in a sinking, sinking situation is those limber holes that Art talked about, you know, with water doesn't necessarily, you know, pass through very easily. And instead of having three pumps, if I'm taking on water by the bow thruster, I could drop that pump up where it's needed. And so that was another, another key thing that, that we've run this pump through many scenarios and used them. And overall for the cost involved um, for a Mariner, to have a little bit of peace of mind, we have to say we highly recommend it. Nice. Question for you, Mike. Uh, did you know where all the through holes, <clears throat> excuse me, the through holes were located? And uh, did you start looking or kind of intuitively knew where they were located? It, that's a, Lorena, that is a great thing. Part of your in an emergency card, right, with the steps to do and closing through holes should be a little, diagram of the boat and where they are. The only reason I've known is I'm like Art, I've climbed in 500,000 different boats and I just knew that each engine had to have an intake, the generator had to have an intake. Um, I, it didn't have evidence of a water maker there, but there certainly could have been a wash down pump or something I didn't know about. And so I was just going from a general, right, generalization and in a truly, in a sinking situation, a, a little card right there by the VHF radio, closed Seacocks, little illustration, here's where they're at, right? As soon as you get all those closed, the next thing you're looking at are your prop shaft or shafts, if it's a twin engine, and your rudder post. Like, when you're in an emergency, you don't think of these things. And so a little bit of preparedness right now, this is a perfect time, people are watching to get this stuff set up. You'll be, happy to, you'll be happy to know I made a diagram of our boat, a little X, red X where every uh, through hole was located and then labeled where it's at, like in, in the head under the, the cupboard, for example. Uh, so we have a diagram right there by the helm in the drawer if we need it or if we have guests and we need their help to find them. Excellent. Extra credit, Lorraine. I'm going to follow yeah, you guys you. around. You've got the bucket. Right. You know where your through halls are. You know, I got to be plus. Be <laughs> more to find mine. Yeah. Black belt. That's, that's terrific. Uh, uh, I hope all of you consider it's a simple thing. It's not an expensive thing to put together. And as Mike said, it's going to give you peace of mind. It could save your boat or somebody else's boat. So think about it. And uh, you've got a video on. Uh, uh, Tech tip 10 on the scallywags. We did have a question that came in. 
could we please uh, uh, spell scallywags? Uh, Mike, do you want to take a shot at it or? It, it, uh, it's up there. Actually, Peter posted a link. It's, to uh, it. S -K I'm gonna, I, I can try, I suppose. S-K-L-L-Y-W-A-G-S. Does that sound about right, Mike? You missed an A, I think. S-K-A, S-K-A, but S -K -A, Peter's got it. The so scallywags me. with a K. Yeah, I didn't have a spell okay, check. And we had a, a comment come in on the chat line reminding us that we could also pull power from uh, if you have a Scotty downrigger, there's usually a power plug related to that. So you may want to have that as an adapter for your uh, power line for the pump. That's the beauty of alligator clips. You can grab onto the posts of a bow thruster. You can grab all different kinds of right. places to, to, right. to, to find right. power. So um, look we're, uh, we're winding down. On yeah, look at the clock, Mark. Uh, this has yeah. been an informative show. It's a show that could save your life if you are in a tough spot. So I'm so appreciative of, of tapping into Art and Mike's. I'm not going to say how many years of experience combined, but that was you guys really can bring it. So thank you. Uh, so we're going to have them back. We we compensate them well in beer. Ha! <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, well, we did have a question come in for you, Peter. Yes. Uh, do we plan to do any fishing? Uh, I saw that. Yet? Lisa Sieb asking that question. And you know, that's a nice, these are softball segues. You got to love them. So yeah, actually, you and I were talking about that earlier today, Mark. We're going to do it. Next week. Next week. Next week, we've November got George 3rd. Harris, I, in theory, coming back uh, to talk uh, fishing 101 and 201. Um, there's some incredible world-class opportunities right in our backyard. Just another uh, reason to really tap into the Puget Sound boating. So yeah, we'll be talking boat, uh, fishing and boating. We use those. Great thing to do with kids, with grandchildren, and and uh, uh, doesn't have to be complicated. That's right. Yeah. Well, great. Well, um, Mark, I got a little trivia for you. You ready uh -oh. for it? Yeah. So the Dow Jones saw some changes this week. Do you know the three companies that came in and came out of the Dow Jones and Landon's? And anyone else can answer as well. Ooh. I read it. And yeah, in, in one ear, out the other ear. I uh, don't well, have any money in the market at the moment. There you go. There you, it's stock tip, maybe. Uh, so Exxon, which was the yes. uh, left, Pfizer and Raytheon all left, and they were replaced by Honeywell, Amgen, and Salesforce. So I thought that was interesting. Sign of the times, uh, apparently. That is. I, I was going to recommend a couple of things that have been uh, keeping our family fun, uh, uh, keeping our our family occupied on the boat uh, on the boat this last several months. It's a game, a card game called Ofruck. We just found it on Amazon. You heard me correctly, Leonard. I saw that look. Oh, Frock. I can say <laughs> yeah. that on Zoom. Oh, it's okay. Fun. Yeah, it's a, a show. It's a Oh, Frock. It's a great one. And then uh, Left, Right, Center. So two dice games. Uh, that's a dice game, Left, Right, Center. And I'm going to put those in the chat. I'm not on commission here. But uh, incredible fun games. They don't cost much. Oh, Frock's a card game that was on um, Shark Tank. And they got some funding. And uh the kids go crazy. I have an eight-year-old and 10-year-old. They go crazy with it. But uh, yeah, it's a, a lot of fun. And then uh, another great activity on the boat is Rubik's Cube, Mark, as you probably know. And I saw this Netflix show, which I want to watch maybe later tonight. It's called Speed Cubers, and it's about the world's fastest Rubik's Cube uh, orchestrators. The, they can get it done in under six seconds, which might, I don't know what your time is, Mark, on that. But It's not six seconds. That's, that's another bit more. Yeah. <laughs> six weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the six week Rubik's Cube might not be the most compelling uh, documentary. But uh, yeah, so that, that's the show. Uh, episode 15, uh, Saturday Night Live's uh, host on their 15th episode was a, uh, Jill Clayburgh. Does that that's name what ring I said last all? week. I was off by a week. Off by a week. You're always studying ahead. Uh, get ahead of yourself there, Mark. Well, I've got nothing else for me. Uh, anything else you all want to say as we say goodnight? Well, we got a holiday weekend coming up. It's uh, a great time to get out boating. Uh, plan ahead for that. And as you heard from us tonight, consider going to the South Sound or get out there early and uh, be patient and uh, practice your anchoring. A lot of great anchoring out there, but the main thing is get out there and do some boating. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate the special guests we had in Landon. It's always great to see you. So at that, on that note, I'm going to say good night. Great. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye, Bye now. Bye.